Welcome, everybody. Welcome to Life Changers Bible Study this Wednesday night. I'm so glad that uh, that you tuned in. Would you um, take a moment and invite somebody to listen to God's word with me tonight and with you, with us? And I wanted to come one on one with you tonight just as a part of Holy Week. And I really want to focus on praying for some that are sick, obviously, and believing God for your healing. We'll talk all about that, uh, a lot about that tonight. But I want to really stress the importance of staying connected. You know, the Bible says that when we're planted in the house of God, that's when we flourish. And God has given us a miracle. And the miracle sometimes is right before our, you know, it's right in front of our nose. It's right in front of our face. And we we don't realize the that God knew this pandemic was going to pass through this earth. And whether whether the world, whether America is handling it the best way uh, or the right way or the way somebody else might handle it or the way we might handle it the next time is irrelevant to us right now. What matters is, is that we pull together and we stay connected and we realize that God knew this was coming. God knew this moment was going to happen. He knew it was going to be right during Holy Week. God knew Holy Week was going to interrupt this virus. God knew Holy Week was going to be the interruption. Jesus interrupted the virus of Satan, the virus of sin, the virus of hell. Jesus came and planted his life in this earth 2000 years ago, and he interrupted Satan's plan and Satan's destruction of mankind and Satan's um, false ownership of the earth. And Jesus interrupted it and he and he gave it. He took it back in his own blood, swore, paid in his own blood and gave it to us. And so I believe that this week is really a celebration of the same Jesus that the same yesterday, the Jesus that is the same yesterday, today and forever. He's the same Jesus that interrupted Satan's plan 2000 years ago, and he's interrupting Satan's plan today through the church. And I want you to know and I want you to understand how important this is, that it really is through the church that Jesus operates in this world. He operates through the church because the church is his body. And I don't mean just our church, Life Changers Church, although I do mean that because we are a part of the overall body of Christ. But I mean, all believers and all churches, all ministries that believe that they are the body of Christ and where there's a pastor and where there's people that are being fed God's word. That's the expression of the church. That's the expression of Jesus as the great shepherd teaching his disciples and teaching the multitude. And now we have churches where there's pastors all over the world that are inviting people to join their church online. And so God knew that this was going to come through the earth and the technology that um, God prepared us for. Do you think that technology was was Bill Gates idea or was um, you know, the, the, the founder of Apple, uh, you know, was it his idea? Sorry for the names that escape me, Stephen Jobs, uh, but all the different peoples, the people who have invented things and had breakthroughs in technology. It wasn't it wasn't them that gave that got the glory. It was God that gave them the idea. And it's God who deserves the glory. Um, so God gave us this technology for such a time as this. And so I want you to stay connected this whole crisis. I want to ask you, for those of you that are a part of our life changers family locally and globally, nationally and around the world, I want to ask you to connect with me and I'm making myself available like I, I understand what it's like if you have been sidelined on your job or your business or your career. Um, during this time. And I know that that God is going to provide for you in various ways. But. Um, for me, I, my job is, you know, my 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 time has been uh, even more intense at 
ministering to people and ministering to you. And I love it. I'm, I'm busier now than I've ever been. I'm trying to get to my book uh, called Soul Power that I'm been working on for for a while now. And uh, but this thing has just gotten the attention of the world and it's captivated our our lives and our world and we're in our homes. And so I want to encourage you because I want to, I've made myself available to connect with you in every way possible. And I want to ask that you connect with me as well. Uh, so Sundays and Wednesdays, church family and those of you that consider this your online church family as well. Let's connect um, the power of connection, you know, when when um, one of the worst things that can happen is when the power goes out in your house, right? Because you can't use the Internet, you can't use you can't have any heat in the winter, you can't have air conditioning in the summer, in the two months of summer that we have in Chicago or the six weeks of summer that we have in this in this area. Right. But um, the you know, you can't use your condition and the lights don't work and you can't you know, you, you can't go to Disney Plus or Netflix or Apple TV or any of that if your power goes out. Right. And so there's something amazing about connection. And God wired us for connection. So in this social distancing season, we need to make sure we stay connected. And I want to encourage you to to put as a priority the connection that you and I can have. So Sundays and Wednesdays are our main services, as always. And of course, this Friday, we're going to have our Good Friday service and um, at 7 p.m. And every day I'm doing live. This is live tonight as well. And I'm doing live every day right around noon. And um, I'm just given daily bread every day for you. So I hope you'll take advantage of that. You certainly can. And you can look at it at any time on our web on our website, um, my Facebook page, Facebook dot com slash Gregory Dickow. So I just want to get a few things, a few of those things out of the way. I want to shoot to a announcement for what's happening at Life Changers Church. And I'll be right back. Hey, church fam. So glad you're with us tonight. Hope you're comfortable. Hope you got some good snacks. Hope you're ready for the word. I know I am. We are excited to bring Life Changers to your home. And we miss you so much. It's awful, but we're embracing it and we're sticking together. We're staying united. It's been great to hear from our pastor every day, and I hope that you're encouraged. We've got um, so much for the kids as well on their social media and for Champion Youth. So stay connected in whatever way you can during this time. And we just want to let you know about some awesome things that are coming up. First, Good Friday this week at 7 p.m. We'll be having our online Good Friday communion service. And if you need communion elements, we're also opening up um, from 3 to 5 p.m. that day. Pastor will actually be outside in a mask and gloves. Um, praying for the cars that are driving by, picking up communion elements. We'll have our food pantry open. We'll have some Easter gifts for the kids because we want to make sure they have chocolate and something great from our kids team. Um, So you're welcome to stop by in that time frame. Also at City Campus from 10 a.m. to 2, our pastoral team will be there as well. So we hope that you will join us for that awesome Good Friday experience. And then on Sunday, Easter Sunday, together with our church family, even though we're in our homes, we're united and we're pumped about it. We're excited for that service experience. Think about five people that you could invite. Just send them the link, send them the times, 9 a.m., 10.30 or 12.30 p.m. Central Time and join in with us. Tune in. God's going to do something great. We're excited about it. If you need anything, though, let us know. We miss you guys. We're here for you. Info's on the screen of how we can connect with you, but do not hesitate to call. I know you're excited about tonight. I'm pumped. So let's lean in and enjoy an awesome word from our past. Welcome back, everybody. And um, as you can see, I'm I'm on the stage of uh, of Life Changers Church today's Wednesday night Bible study. But the reason I wanted to just come one on one with you tonight is I want to have a special time of worship and and praise and and uh, on our Good Friday service at 7 p.m. So we're going to save that for uh, Friday night and Friday night lights and then uh, Sunday morning, of course, Resurrection Sunday, Easter Sunday is going to be really beautiful and amazing. And, you know, nothing can really separate us from the love of God. If you think about it, our Heavenly Father is in heaven. Right. And but yet we're connected to him through the Holy Spirit. 
and we're connected to him through the body of Christ. And we are still the church, even though we're gathering online only right now. We are still the church and we're still powerful and you are powerful and the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. And when you understand that, when you really believe that, then you are going to be more powerful because we're better together. You know, one, the Bible says, can put a thousand to flight two can put 10,000 to flight. Now, I'm going to get into the Bible study in a moment, but I want to say a few things first, because because I keep this is a uh, just a deep theme in my soul, in my heart for you and for me and for the body of Christ right now in this time to to make sure that we take advantage of this moment, to make sure that because, look, we want we want this to end. But there are some great things that we can take from this. We want this to be over, but there are some great things. Somebody asked me today. We had a question and answer and daily. I've been doing the last couple of days question and answer as well as a daily bread. But um, somebody asked me, what's what's the takeaway? What's the what would be the best way to what's the best thing we can learn from this crisis? And I think the best thing we can learn from this crisis or any crisis is to reprioritize our lives and um, and to really understand what's important, that when it's all said and done, people are what matters most. Connection is what matters most. And I want to encourage you before we get into the teaching today to build a like have a place. I don't care where it is in your home, in your house, but from now until we we are able to come back together on site. Can you like pick a place in your house, in your apartment, if it's a one bedroom apartment, if it's a studio, if it's a big house, it doesn't matter. But pick one place, one corner. If it's going to be your bed, hey, I get it. You know, we're going to wake up, you know, you're going to wake up in bed and turn, you know, turn the service on. That's totally cool. I don't care where it is, but treat it like that's your your home altar, like the altar of your house. Like I'm at the altar of our church right here and pick a place. Maybe it's at the fireplace if you guys have one and get your whole family together and say we're having church and to open up your computer, or your tablet or whatever, and tune in. Like, don't just have your family members spread out all over the place. Gather them six feet apart if you need to. But, you know, with the lo- you know, with an individual family, obviously our germs are already in each other's lives. But but um, let's let's build an altar. You know, the first thing Noah did after the flood was he got off the ark and he built an altar and gave an offering to God. And I believe that your home can have an altar. And if it's just you that live alone or you're just a couple or if you're a single mom or if you're a family of, you know, nuclear family of father, mother and and children, build a just don't build anything. Just pull your couch up, pull your chairs up, make it the place, make it your church location, make it your seats at Life Changers, make it your family altar. OK, I just encourage you to do that. And um, and then let me share a, a couple thoughts before again, before I, I will also have an opportunity to give in our tithes and offerings in a moment. And um, and we'll have the number up and we'll have the the address up and we'll have the bill. You can you can have the link up. We'll have the link up. We'll have all the different ways that you can give in a moment. But um, I want to just try to get you to join me in how I've been processing through this pandemic, this uh, this season, this crisis. Um, And here's what here's some things I wrote down. If we beat this virus, but we don't learn God's promises of healing, then what have we learned? If we beat this virus, but we don't learn to take care of our soul, what did we learn? If we beat this virus and when I say if it's not if it's when you you know what I mean. But if we beat this virus, but we don't learn to be more compassionate, 
What did we learn? If we don't learn to be more compassionate with others, what did we learn? If we beat this virus and we don't learn to be generous and to be more generous and to be generous in tough times and to be generous in difficult times, what then did we learn if we beat this virus, but we don't reprioritize our lives? What did we learn if we beat this this virus, but we don't defeat fear? Then what did we learn? if we beat this virus, but don't grow in our connection with God and with one another, then what did we learn? I believe as we beat this virus, we need to learn God's promises for healing because there'll there'll be another sickness that will come. There'll be another disease that will come. That's why we're learning God's promises. When we beat this virus and as we beat this virus, We need to learn to take care of our soul, because as your soul goes, so will go the rest of your life. You're only as healthy um, physically, relationally, materially, financially. You're only as healthy as your soul. Soul health will develop and turn into whole health. If we beat this virus as we beat this virus, let's learn generosity and let's learn to be givers. Let's learn to share. Let's learn to know that it's not there's just not one pie that everybody has to get a piece of. God is the multiplier of pies. He's the multiplier of apples. He's the multiplier of apple orchards. As we beat this virus, let's reprioritize our lives. As we beat this virus, let's put first things first and let's strip away the things that don't really matter. Let's strip away all of our petty offenses and the things that used to bother us. Now people are dying and now and look, whether whether people are blowing this out of proportion, whether we've overreacted or not, it's irrelevant. What matters is what are we going to learn? What are we going to learn? And I want you to learn to prioritize, reprioritize your life. And as we beat this virus, let's let's beat fear as we beat this virus. Let's um, Let's grow in our connection with God and with one another and with the church, the body of Christ for which the gates of hell cannot prevail against. Amen. Well, I hope um, that makes sense to you. I thought I'd read a couple testimonies uh, before we give to the Lord in a moment. Um, But um, one of the things, one of the ways that life changers is staying connected is obviously our food pantries open, as you heard, you can always come to that. You can always call for prayer. But one of the things that we've done is we've initiated an outgoing connect call to all of our members and all of our attenders, at least everybody we have a record for over the last um, uh, over the last year or two years. We're calling everybody. So we have a team of 20 or 30 of our staff and some of our pastoral team that are calling everybody that we have a phone number for. And we're just asking if they need prayer. We're just asking them how they're doing and we're praying for them. We're finding out as we call people. Some people are sick. We're calling. We're finding out some people are hurting financially. Some people need groceries and we're meeting those needs. And we're finding out that people just needed a a friend. And we're finding out people just needed a moment to connect with their church family. So we're not just waiting for our services. We're not just waiting for Sunday and Wednesday. We're coming. We're bringing life changers to you on Sunday and Wednesday. We're bringing life changers to you with a personal phone call. Now, if for some reason we missed you, if we called you and we didn't get through to you or we don't have your phone number, call us anytime. Leave your number, leave your information. Eight, four, seven, six, four, five, ninety one hundred eight, four, seven, six, four, five, ninety one hundred. And some of the some of the some of the stories, just a few really great stories, at least uh, from our calls to people, our connect calls. And I want to connect with you and our team wants to connect with you because we're still the church. We're still the church. Somebody wrote in and said, I just I had just gotten home after being laid off from work and literally prayed five minutes before I got a call from the life changers team. How awesome was that timing? We prayed together over the phone. I felt encouraged. I felt God was so personal in my life and he knew and loved me so much. And he gave me his attention that he would time that out in such a way that um, that I got that call. And I want to pray for those of you that have been laid off right now and just out of inspiration for this moment. 
And let's pray together. Those of you that are working and you're, you're in a job that is continuing in this time. Let's pray for those that aren't. And let's pray for those that are without. And Lord, we just agree together. You said if two or three agree about anything to ask, it shall be done. And we agree together right now. I agree with my church member, my brother, my sister, my friend. And we agree right now in the name of Jesus, there is not a needy one among us. There will not be a needy one among us, according to Acts chapter four. I release blessing and increase and support from you, Lord, in any way you choose. Lord, you have a million ways to provide for us. We thank you for your provision. We thank you for the assistance that is coming through our tax benefits, through the government, giving back our tax dollars to take care of these moments and these gaps. I thank you for the church's ability to help those that are suffering. I thank you, Lord, for family members that are able to help in times of need. And we thank you that there will not be a needy one among us in Jesus name. Amen. So we're standing together and we're agreeing together. Another great quick testimony. When I got the call from Life Changers, this was the last place I expected to get a call from. You see, I had visited with my friend back in 2014. It was like a miracle to hear from you guys. That day I got the call. I was struggling with my living situation because my college was closing and I had nowhere to live. But I felt so much peace after praying with your team. And I look forward to visiting again when I'm back in Chicago. Another great testimony. Um, Somebody wrote in and said, thank you for being on Facebook and Instagram live every day and speaking to us. It has helped me over my to overcome my fears and my panic attacks. My panic attacks have ceased and I'm thanking God for you. So this person's fears and panic attacks stopped through our daily bread and our daily communion together, our daily fellowship together. Another person said, um, I was just watching from Trinidad. Your message has helped me make it through this season. Another one said, I've come out of a very abusive cult like legalistic fundamental church system. I know what that's like. I came out of that as well years ago. I had felt like my messed up mind could never be fixed. And now it has been renewed. I found your preaching to set me free. And I'm really grateful to hear that. Thank you, whoever that is that sent that. I really appreciate it. Um, Can I tell you that um, that giving in a crisis, we're going to give at this time in our service, that giving in a crisis is really um, the best time to give. I mean, we need to give in good times. We need to give when we have an abundance and we need to give when we don't throughout the Bible. The the financial miracles throughout the Bible were miracles of people that were in lack, whether it was the widow that had just left a little barrel of meal and a jar of oil and Elijah had nothing to eat and they all ate on that little barrel of meal and jar of oil when she gave it to the prophet. And it lasted three and a half years to the other widow who in Elisha's day, she didn't know what to do to pay her debt. And Elisha said, what do you have in your house? Like everybody's got something to give. What do you have in your house? The miracle that you need starts with what you have, not with what you don't have. The little boy with five loaves and two fish fed multitudes like every miracle uh, that had to do with finances or physical provision or sustenance sustenance. It happened. All those miracles happened in a moment of lack. All those miracles happened when there wasn't enough. And God wants you to know that even when there's not enough, there will always be enough and there will always be a way that God will get it to you, because if God can get it through you, God can get it to you. And I don't want to take a long time with this moment of giving, but there's going to be several ways on your screen that you can give. But um, I'm reminded of this um, this preacher that I know of that told this story. And this is giving in tough times. This is an example of giving in tough times. He said, while I was preaching one Sunday, an elderly woman named Mary fainted and she struck her head on the end of the pew and she got knocked unconscious. Immediately, an EMT in the congregation called an ambulance. The ambulance came and everybody was gathered around her. They strapped her to a stretcher. She was still unconscious. 
and they were getting ready to go out the door into the ambulance to the hospital. And just as they were getting ready to head out the door, Mary, the, the elderly woman who had gotten knocked out, she regained her consciousness and she motioned for her daughter that was with her at church that day. She motioned for her daughter to come near. And everyone thought she was asking her daughter to come near so she could convey her final words as she was just regaining consciousness. And the daughter leaned over and put her ear right up to her mother's mouth. And the mother whispered, my offering is in my purse. Make sure to give it my offering. Ladies in the stretcher, she's being carried out of the church. She got knocked out unconscious from the church pew. If anything, you'd think she could sue the church. But instead, her parting words as she's going to the ambulance is my offerings in my purse. Make sure to give it my offerings in my purse. Make sure to give it, you know, in tough times, tough times never last, but tough people do. I want to invite you to give in Acts chapter 11, verse 28. They were in a crisis and the prophet stood up and said, look, our brethren are going to suffer and we need to encourage them and we need to help them. And so they all gave and all the disciples gave so that they could help the, the members of the church that were in the days of Claudius going to endure a famine. And God supplied through the disciples giving and God's going to supply to you through your giving and God's going to supply to other people through your giving. So would you take advantage right now of giving online? It's the best way to give. You can also sign up for recurring giving or auto debit giving. And um, if you're on your laptop, you can just open up another browser and go to lifechangerschurch.com slash give or find the give tab and the rest is self-explanatory. You can give on your phone. You can give through our app. You can give you can text to give seven, seven, nine, seven, seven. And um, that's really a great way to give. And you can also mail in. We have people that are mailing in their offerings, their tithe to twenty five hundred Beverly Road, Hoffman Estates, six oh one nine two. We have people that are stopping by and dropping off their offering and their tithe. Uh, we have people that are giving by phone and you can call eight, four, seven, six, four, five, ninety one hundred. If you're more comfortable with somebody uh, and sharing your confidentiality with somebody on the phone, that's great, too. And you're also welcome to stop by our Hoffman campus um, during our office hours throughout the week, Monday through Friday from um, 9 a.m. to 530 p.m. OK, Lord, thank you that you meet all our needs. You meet every person's needs. We thank you. The church will always remain open. We thank you. The church will always be here for people. We thank you. The church is not suffering, but people are and people are the church. And therefore, we're, if one of us suffer, all of us suffer. And Lord, we bless every person's seed as it goes into the ground. And we thank you that it will multiply in Jesus name. Amen. Well, are you ready to s- thank you for giving? Thank you so much. And um, however, whatever format you want to do that in. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And. Um, I know God is going to take care of you. Keep us posted. All right. Connect with us. Let us know where you're watching from as well. Um, I want to talk about healing and I want to talk about the mercy seat of God. And I'd like to talk to you about um, out of Hebrews, chapter four, verse 16. And if we just study the Bible a little bit, Hebrews, chapter four, verse 16. And um, several years ago, the Lord spoke to me and he said, son, I want you to live from my throne. I want you to live at my throne and I want you to live for my throne. And that became a a theme that I talk about a lot. And um, all of our teaching, all of my teaching is going to address one of those three areas of your life. It's either going to be talking to you about how to live from the throne of God, which is your authority, how to live from a place of of authority and dominion, or it's going to be how to give glory to God, how to live for the throne of God, how to live for something bigger than ourselves, for the glory of God, for eternity. Or it's going to be about how to live at the throne of God. And today I want to focus on coming at the throne of God, living at the throne of God. And um, 
in Luke chapter, excuse me, in Hebrews chapter four, verse verse 16. And I'll start from the New American Standard Bible, Hebrews chapter four, verse 16. And he says, therefore, and it's just a beautiful verse, he said, let us he says, let us therefore draw near with confidence. Let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. Now, I believe that every one of us needs to become acquainted with the throne of grace, because specifically today I want to talk to you about the mercy of God. And living in the mercy of God and what mercy is in some places in the Bible, the word mercy is translated as compassion or loving kindness. But it's the same word and it comes from the original Hebrew word Hasid, which means um, loving kindness. It means um, a covenant kindness like like I'm sworn to show you kindness, whether you deserve it or not. And I'm sworn to be kind to you. You know, sometimes when. When we think about being kind to somebody, it's because they don't deserve it. You know, sometimes our kindness is really something that we need to use as a um, as a a tool of generosity, as a tool of of emotional health and strength, meaning when somebody treats you wrong, you show them kindness anyway, even though they don't deserve it. Kindness is really special when somebody doesn't deserve it. Like sometimes we can be like nobody's been rude to any restaurant servers lately because there are no there there is no in dining anymore. Right. Right now. I mean, I'm believing God that those jobs are going to come back soon and restaurants are going to open soon. But sometimes we can be unkind to a server, a, a, a woman or a man who's serving and we don't know what they're going through, but they're not they're They're slow or maybe the Grubhub is slow or the, you know, in how in, you know, the dining out uh, dash, dining dash, dash to dine and dash, whatever it's called. Don't dine and dash. But you know what I'm talking about. Um, maybe the person was rude or maybe the person didn't do it on time. Like we've had food delivered to us and they forgot something and we've driven ourselves and I drove a few days ago to pick up something that a company, a restaurant had, had forgotten. And and the lady was so nice and she was like, I'm so sorry. And I didn't walk in with an attitude like I have, like I have before, but I didn't walk in with an attitude that day. Um, I just looked at her and I said, you know what? Don't even think about it. Don't even worry about it. It's no big deal at all. It's just food. It's just food. And we got to and it, even though she was kind, I was kinder. I was already determined to be kind, whether she admitted it was her fault or not. And I wasn't going to go there and tell her it was her fault because I didn't really care whose fault it was. I just wanted to eat. You know what I'm saying? Like we can't get focused on finding fault. This is a great opportunity for us to learn to be gracious and merciful and kind to people. And so I want to talk about that and what mercy is, because because he said we can come to the throne of grace to receive mercy and to find grace to help in our time of need. Man, we need mercy right now. We need grace. We need grace. Now, remember the difference between mercy and grace. OK, I want to make it easy in the verse. Uh, if it's still up there, you can see that he said we he said, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace. Aren't you glad it's not the throne of judgment? Aren't you glad it's not the throne of of harassment, the throne of the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Aren't you glad it's the throne of grace? The throne of grace is God's unmerited love and favor toward us. It's God's unearned love and favor. And if you guys I don't know if that verse is on the screen, but you just leave it up there until I move on to the next one, just for the people's sake to see this. Thank you so much. Um, I think that it's so vital that we understand this word, the throne of grace. God rules with grace. God governs with grace. The throne is a place of government. The throne is the place of rulership. 
the throne is the place of dispensing kingly duty and authority. And what does God call it? The throne of grace. I'm so glad it's not the throne of what you deserve. I'm so glad it's not the throne of what I deserve. I'm so glad it's called the throne of grace. And we can draw near with confidence to this place because Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19 says that we draw near or we draw boldly or we come boldly in in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19. He says we can come boldly to the holy place by the blood of Jesus. We can have confidence to enter the holy place. And what is that holy place? It's the place of God's throne, the throne of his grace. And we enter the holy place with confidence because or by the blood of Jesus. We don't enter by our song. You say, oh, man, we didn't do any song. So are we in God's presence? Heck, yes, we're in God's presence. We're always in God's presence and his presence is always in us. Our song, we don't we don't come into God's presence by our singing. We come into God's presence with our singing. We don't come into God's presence by our thanksgiving. Well, if you thank him enough, you can come into his presence. No, we come into his presence by the blood. We come with thanksgiving, but not by thanksgiving. We come with praise, but not by praise. We come with song and with singing, but not because of singing. You see, we have confidence to enter the holy place by what? By one thing, the blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus gives us access to the holy place. Now, back in Hebrews 4, 16, we can now confidently come to the throne of grace to what? That we may receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. Our country is in a time of need. We need mercy. Um, The world, Italy is in a time of need. It needs mercy. New York is in a time of need. It needs mercy. And I, I just use those names geographically, but it's the people there, obviously, the people of Spain, the people of of New Jersey, the people that are that have been hurt the most. And I, I, no matter what, any suffering is is too much and more than what any of us want. But um, we need God's mercy. And I want to just go through a list of scriptures for you and just show you how it was through a connection or an understanding of God's mercy that healing flowed. And see, I know that in prayer meetings and in um, national gatherings and I know that sometimes the church can churches can get really zealous and draw on Second Chronicles, chapter seven, verse 14. And if my people that are called by my name will humble themselves and you know, repent of their sins and I will hear from heaven and heal their land. Well, that's an old covenant verse. That we have it's a promise that God will heal our land, but he won't heal our land because of our repentance in the new covenant. He, he he will heal you because of his mercy. He will heal our land because of his mercy. He will heal your body because of his mercy. He will heal your family because of his mercy. He will heal Italy because of his mercy. Well, you know, if the if, if if all the Catholics in Italy would just pray harder, will God heal the land? No, he will not heal the land because they prayed harder. He'll heal the land because of his mercy. Well, if America will repent of its abortion and repent of its uh, homosexuality and repent of, you know, its racism and repent. And I'm not trying to equate those things. You, you know, those any of those things can be on whatever scale that you think those things are. I'm not here to judge anybody, but I'm here to say, America, God is not going to heal America because we repent of being Democrats or we repent of being Republicans. God's going to heal America because of his mercy. Wow, I got your attention yet or am I making you fall asleep like I'm pretty tired, too, so and hungry. But uh, (laughs) but hang in there with me. Are you at the family altar? Is are you a single person? You're you're a family. You and God are a family and you and us as a church are a family. So stay at that altar until we're done. Dang it. Just kidding. All right. um, But uh, let me go through some of the scriptures here on mercy. Um, 
Matthew, chapter nine, verse twenty seven. As Jesus went out from there, two blind men followed him, crying loudly, have mercy on us, son of David. And you know what happened? Jesus healed them. Have mercy on us. See, these people, they understood what touched the heart of God. They understood how to connect with the heart of God. They understood how to connect with the power of God, not by might or power. It's not by our might or our our power. It's not by our holiness. In fact, remember when um, the the, uh, was it Peter and Peter and John in Acts chapter three, when the man was at the beautiful gate, the lame man was at the beautiful gate and he and he begged them to give him money. And and Peter looked at him and said and they looked at him and said, silver and gold, we don't have. But what we do have, we give you in the name of Jesus, rise and walk. And then people marveled and said, wow, you know, these guys healed this this man. And Peter made a note to say he especially said, make sure you know, he said, I want you to know, everybody, that it wasn't our religion or our holiness. He used the word piety. Maybe you guys can find that verse. It's later in Acts chapter three. He said, it's not our piety. It's not our purity or our holiness that healed this man. No, it was the name of Jesus that healed this man. It was Jesus Christ of Nazareth that healed this man. It wasn't our piety. It wasn't our, you know, proving how holy we were. It's the mercy of God. It's the mercy. Have mercy on us, son of David, they said in Matthew, chapter 10. We're going to pray for healing in a, in a few moments when I'm done. But um, Matthew, chapter nine, verse twenty seven. Have mercy on us, son of David, and he healed them. Matthew, chapter 15, verse twenty two. Then came the Canaanite woman from that region. She came out and started shouting, have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. And you know what happened? Jesus healed her. In Matthew, chapter 17, verse 15. The man said, Lord, have mercy on my son, boy, who has a loved one who's suffering right now. This verse is for you. Have mercy on my son. He said, my son is has is epileptic. One translation says a lunatic. It's the word epilepsy. And he suffers terribly. He falls into the fire and falls into the water and Jesus healed him. Another two blind men in Matthew, chapter 20, this is a second occurrence. It was a different two blind men in Matthew, chapter 20, verse 30. There were two blind men sitting by the roadside. And when they heard that Jesus was passing by, they shouted, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. And the crowd ordered them to be quiet. But they shouted even more loudly, have mercy on us, Lord, son of David. And if you look in the next verse, I think it says, and Jesus called them over to him and said, what do you want me to do for you? And they said, we want to be healed. We want to be able to see and look at what happens in verse thirty four. And Jesus said, be it done to you, move with compassion. And this word compassion is the word mercy and moved with mercy. They asked for mercy and Jesus was moved with mercy. And it says in verse thirty four, moved with mercy tender mercy or compassion. Jesus touched their eyes and immediately they regained their sight and followed him. And I want to pause for a moment and I want to let you know something. So many Christians around the world are searching for what they did wrong or what somebody else did wrong. Could we stop that? Could we stop blaming anybody like it's all Adam and Eve's fault to begin with anyway? So we got to stop. Like, I don't care if it was China's fault. I don't care if it was a bat. I don't care if it was Batman. I don't care if it was somebody accidentally spilling some virus. I I don't care if if I do care. Obviously, you know, I care. But my point is, is it doesn't matter at the end of the day what the cause of the virus was. What matters is what moves Jesus is mercy. What moves Jesus is mercy. What moved him to heal these people in every occurrence that I'm giving you, they asked him for mercy and he met them with mercy and mercy showed up as healing. And isn't one of uh, uh, one of our naval ships called the Mercy ship? Uh, It's I don't I think it is. I think it's one of our naval ships called the Mercy ship. What a power. One of the names of our ships 
is called the compassion ship. My God, like, can you get any more like and that ship pulled into the harbor of New York and everybody was celebrating. It was just a, a wholly awesome moment. For those of you that are watching in New York, we are standing with you. We're not thinking all oh, those New Yorkers, they're such worse sinners than us. We didn't have it so bad in, you know, in Portland, Maine. We didn't have it so bad in, you know, in uh, Kalamazoo, Michigan. We didn't have it so bad in Timbuktu, such and such place like it's not because you guys are so holy. It's because there just aren't a lot of people around you. It's like there's 30 of you that live in one city. And they got three, you know, 13 million living in one city on a little small little island called Manhattan. So um, the point is, it's not all those New Yorkers. You know what? I mean, you think about it, if all if if judgment was because of God, you know, if if all the things that all the bad was happening in this world because it was God's judgment against sin, which is such a stupid theology. Yeah. I called you stupid if you think that that's stupid. That's just stupid thinking like either Jesus took God's judgment on his body when he became sin for us, took the curse for us, took our sickness by his stripes, were healed. Either he took all that or he didn't. Either Jesus took the judgment or he didn't. But God's not judging America because well, all the sin in America, because look, if God was well, you know, God's judging God's judge. If God's judging New York, you know, if God was judging cities because of the sin in their city, wouldn't he be judging sin city itself? Las Vegas isn't Las Vegas called sin city. Should, I mean, if I mean, I think if God's going to judge a city, it should be there first. Just Las Vegas, man, gambling, you know, the gamblers, the ramblers, the scramblers, the hustlers, the hookers, you know, all, shouldn't the judgment fall there first? My God, people. What's happening in New York has nothing to do with New York's sin, the sin of the people in New York. It has to do with 20 million people living in a, you know, in one apartment building. I don't you know, I don't know how many people there are. There's a lot. Uh, I'm sick and tired of God getting a bad name and Jesus being like us having a cheap version of Jesus, like he didn't do enough to absorb our judgment, like him becoming sin for us isn't enough. Him taking his, our stripes by his stripes were healed, him becoming a curse for us so that we could have the blessing of Abraham. Like that's not a, like he didn't do enough that God has to judge America and judge the world with the coronavirus. Sorry. No, that's not the gospel. The gospel is Jesus took it all and Jesus did it all. That's the gospel. It's good news. You can be healed from it all. Why? Because of mercy. Well, you're you're sure ornery pastor. I'm ornery at religion. I'm mad. I'm at war with religion because religion feeds false religion, feeds this this idea, this notion that God's mad. He's fed up. He's had it up to here. You know, he's up to his nostrils in your sin. He washed your sin away. The Bible says God is laughing in heaven. He's rejoicing in heaven over every soul that is saved. He's having a party in heaven. Every soul that gets saved. God is throwing a party. They're partying every minute. Somebody's getting every second. Somebody's getting saved somewhere in this world and they are having a party in heaven over one soul being saved. All the angels in heaven rejoice. The Bible says one one sinner is saved. All the angels in heaven rejoice. Oh, we think that's what the angels are doing. Oh, that's not rejoicing. Rejoicing is. Yeah. Woo. Glory to God. Let's have a party, get some food. Nobody, nobody watching me right now has a party without food. So and when the prodigal son came home, that's what they had. Uh, I, am I getting too loud for you? They came. He came home. And what did the father do? bring the bring the best robe, put a ring on his finger, kill the fatted calf. We're having red meat tonight. For this son of mine was lost 
and he's been found. The son of mine was dead and now he's alive. Mercy. It's mercy. Father, make me you make me like one of your like before he could even get his speech out of his father, make me like bring the best father runs to him, hugs him, falls on him, grabs him. No, you're not giving me your speech, your religious speech that you prepared. You know, I was so afraid when I was a kid. I was like eight or nine years old, you guys. And or maybe it was 10. I don't know, but it was going to be my first communion as a Catholic boy, little Catholic boy, little sinner boy you know, a little Catholic kid just going to confession. And uh, and it was supposed to be this is going to be my first communion. So it was the first Sunday and they were going to announce it's the first communion. And I thought I'm going to have to get up and I'm going to be embarrassed. And I grew up with kind of social anxiety in my life. I think I figured out how you know why I was such a a, a loner and why I was so um, to myself or shy was like that kind of vibe in me. And so you can be healed from that stuff like I'm being healed from it. But um, but I'll never forget. I was I was so afraid. I was like so nervous, like I thought, what am I going to say when the priest says, come up here for your first communion? Because I had seen some other kids like in previous months or previous years that have gotten their first had their first time that they took communion on Sunday, you know, you know, blah, 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 all that. And, you know, given the bread and, the you know, and the cup and um, and nothing against that. The Catholics, man, they 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 got this communion stuff figured out, man. They believe, hey, they've been drinking, drinking from this, drinking from the silver cup. You know, don't give up until you drink from the silver cup, you know, um, <laughs> and um, a song by America for some of my older people watching. Um, but uh, they you know, they they've been drinking from the same cup for years. So I don't know how they did it, but they're they're somehow they're they've been protected. But anyway, I thought I got to get up there and I got to say something. And I was so afraid. And all that happened at the at the what actually went as it turned out. um, I just got up with everybody else, went in the line with everybody else, took my first communion with everybody else. And it was no big deal at all. I don't know how I got on that story, but um, somehow uh, what I was afraid of never came to pass. Um, Back to mercy. Okay, stick to the subject, Pastor. Right. Um, Let's keep going through this list and I want to pray for you. Um, And normally if I had a if the if you guys were here in the building, somebody would have yelled out, you were talking about such and such. And then it would remind me. But um, sorry for that little um, memory lapse. Okay. Um, the Gadder, the Gadarene demoniac, Mark five, verse 19. But Jesus refused and said to him, go home to your friends. After he cast the devil out of him, the man said, I want to follow you. He said, no, go home to your friends, go home and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and what mercy he has shown you. What mercy he has shown you. The gospel is the gospel of mercy, the gospel of grace. Um, Blind Bartimaeus, Mark 10, 47, when he heard it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Notice I want to just remind you. Matthew 9, 27, Matthew 15, 22, Matthew 17, 15, Matthew 20, verse 30, Mark, chapter five, verse nine, Mark, chapter 10, verse 47. We're in now. And every one of these healings took place when somebody said, Jesus, have mercy on me. Jesus, have mercy on me. Blind Bartimaeus said, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many sternly ordered him to be quiet. And he cried out even more. Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus healed him in Luke, chapter one, verse fifty eight. Elizabeth's pregnancy, her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown her shown his great mercy to her. Notice his mercy to her was that she was able to have a baby at an old age. God's mercy to her was he healed her of her barrenness. He healed Bartimaeus of his blindness. He healed the demon possessed child of the of the demonic power. He healed the the um, the the son in Matthew 17 of his epilepsy, the two blind people in Matthew a chapter nine of their of their blindness. Um, All these different manifestations of God's healing 
were through the mercy of God. The mercy of God. How about 10 lepers in Luke, chapter 17, verse 13? They called out all 10 of them. They raised their voices, saying, Jesus, master, have mercy on us, have mercy on us. What we need right now. Is mercy. What we need right now is mercy. What is mercy? Grace is God giving us what we don't deserve. We don't deserve salvation. He gives us salvation. We don't deserve healing. He gives us healing. We don't deserve um, we don't deserve a blessing. He gives us his blessing. What is mercy? It's God withholding from us what we do deserve. You know, the person that smoked all their life and says, God, could you heal me? Yeah, he can heal you. You know, the person that has a weak immune system right now, man, I got a weak immune system. Lord, I, I, I probably deserve to die of this virus. No. Yeah, you might deserve to die from your sin. You, you know, Adam's sin. Yeah, the guy that smoked all his life deserves to die of lung cancer. But God's not going to heal you because you quit. God's not going to heal you because you never smoked all your life. God's going to heal you because of his mercy. The throne of grace is open for you to receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. Um, Epaphroditus, one more example of mercy. Epaphroditus in Philippians 2, 25 to 27. I considered it, Paul said, a necessity to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother, fellow worker, fellow soldier. But your messenger, the one who ministered to my need, since he was longing for you all and was distressed because you had heard that he was sick, for indeed he was sick almost to death. He was sick almost to death. Watch this. But God had mercy on him. But God, but God, but God, are you dealing with sickness? But God, are you dealing with the point of death? But God, are you dealing with the financial crisis? But God, are you dealing with a family situation? But God, are you dealing with? In fact, in Ephesians chapter two, it says you were lost. You were separated from God. You deserve to be to be cast into hell. But God being rich in his mercy, I think it's Ephesians two, verse five. But God being rich in his mercy, but God, but God, rich in mercy, rich in mercy. I think we're all trying to figure out what do we do wrong? What did this person do wrong? What did this country do wrong? What did this person do wrong? What did that person do wrong? Stop it. We all did something wrong. You know what we need right now? Mercy, not to fix the blame, but to come to the throne of grace to receive mercy, mercy, mercy. What are we talking about? Mercy. And what does mercy bring the healing gift that comes from mercy? The mercy of healing, the mercy gift. You know. In the Hebrew language, the word mercy. Is this word loving kindness? One translation has in the Old Testament covenant loyalty. Because God is kind and he's made a covenant with us through the blood of Jesus, we can have mercy. Do you know, see, we have the right to mercy, not because we don't deserve the punishment. We deserve the sickness. We deserve the flu. We deserve the virus. We deserve all the bad because all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But God being rich in mercy, but God being rich in mercy. You know, there's a lot of suffering going on in the world today, and I'm about to close here and pray for you. But there's a lot of suffering going on in the world today. And when when I look through the scriptures. And. When I see pain the different types of pain in the Bible. The thing that God always meets pain with is mercy. I love that scripture that we just read in Philippians two when it says Epaphroditus was sick to the point of death. But God. 
But God had mercy on him. God had mercy on him and not only on him, but on me. Can we be people? That can believe that even though we don't deserve it, God will give us mercy, even though we deserve the judgment, God will give us the mercy instead because of Jesus. Can we believe for those of us who have family members? Oh, they deserve that sickness. They deserve that or they deserve that or they deserve what what they got. They got what's coming to them. You know, I believe that even people in prison that are being punished for their crimes. Even some are being put to death for their crimes and whether you politically believe in capital punishment or not is not my argument today. Each of those people need an opportunity for God's mercy before they die or before their sentence ends. And that's why we go into the prison systems and that's why we go into the jails and that's why we go into the youth, the youth homes and we minister to people. Because God is a God of mercy. You know, I'll close with the story. I've told you before about um, the woman, the mother of a soldier in um, Napoleon's day when Napoleon was the ruler of the world. He had conquered the entire civilized world at that time. And or he was on his way, well on his way to conquering the entire civilized world. And one of the soldiers committed treason and betrayed Napoleon. So the soldier was going to be. Was was headed to the guillotine. He was his his head was about to be cut off for his crime of treason, betrayal against Napoleon. And the mother yelled out to the emperor, Napoleon, who was there. As the story goes, oh, great emperor, oh, great emperor, have mercy on my child. That's my son. Have mercy on my child. Napoleon looked at the mother and said, Madam, do you realize what your child has done against this country and against your emperor? He doesn't deserve mercy. The mother said, oh, great emperor, If he deserved it, it wouldn't be mercy. And at that moment. The emperor released the prisoner and he was set free. If he deserved it, it wouldn't be mercy, she said. You know, if we deserved it, it wouldn't be grace. If we deserved it, it wouldn't be mercy. Whether your pain today is the pain of economic pain that is the result of this virus, whether it's the pain of a lost loved one, whether it's the pain of a disability that one of your children might have or that you might have, whether it's the pain of suffering some enormous loss, whether it's the pain of guilt, whether it's the pain of feeling less than, whether it's the pain of of this virus in you, you're afraid this cough, maybe it's the vi- mercy. Maybe I had it coming to me. You know, maybe your mother said you should have wore a coat. You should have wore, you know, you should have dressed up warm and, you know, in the winter. All these reasons why we feel bad or feel guilty or feel like ah, I don't deserve to be healthy. Mercy is what we need right now. Mercy triumphs over judgment. James two says mercy triumphs over judgment. I want to pray for two things today before we close tonight. Number one, if you're not born again, if you're not sure you're going to heaven when you die, I want to pray for you and then I want to pray for healings. But first, for those of you that have never received Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. Will you come to him today? He's come to you. He's brought me into your home somehow, somehow, by accident, by miracle. I'm in your home right now and I'm so grateful. I'm on your phone right now. I'm on your podcast right now. And if you died today, are you absolutely sure that you would go to heaven when you die? Well, see, everybody believes when it comes down to it. Most people believe there's a heaven and there there's a hell and there is a heaven and there is a hell, whether we believe it or not. It really exists. 
whether you believe that in my past or not, it existed. Whether you believe I used to be a drug druggie or not, I was. You don't have to believe it for it to be true. It's true. If you're not absolutely sure that when you die, you go to heaven, pray this prayer with me and wherever you are at your family altar, wherever you are on your phone, wherever you are at your home, would you pray with us and just say this, Heavenly Father, pray this out loud so that just as a act of faith for those that may be praying this for the first time, Heavenly Father, I invite Jesus Christ into my life. Just say that out loud as my Savior and Lord. I receive your forgiveness for my sins. I believe Jesus died and rose from the dead. I believe the blood of Jesus cleanses me from all my sin. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, congratulations. You are now my brother. You are now my sister. You are now a part of our spiritual family. You're a part, most importantly, of God's. Family. And today your new life begins. You say, what if I fall again? What if I sin again? What if I stumble? We are all going to fall again. We're all going to sin again. We're all going to make mistakes again. It's already forgiven. Just get back up. You fall, get back up. You fall, get back up. Just keep getting back up. Dust, wipe the dust off your knees, your feet. Get up, get up, get up. For those of you that are down right now, get up. Those of you that are depressed, get up. Those of you that feel like I'm a failure, my job, I lost my job, I lost my business, I'm a failure. It says nothing to do with you. This is nothing you did that caused this. But God's going to be merciful. God is going to be gracious. His throne is open 24 hours a day. Go to him boldly, confidently. If you prayed that prayer, let me know. I want to send you this book, The Power of a New Life. It's my gift to you. It's the next steps of this journey with God. It'll show you what just happened and it'll it'll take you through the foundations of a victorious walk with God. Congratulations. I'm so happy for you. If I if I sound a little low key, it's you know, we're in your home. It's this kind of atmosphere. Sunday, I'll be, you know, more raw. Uh, Friday, I'll be more all about communion and um, all the blessings of the of the blood covenant. Wow. This is what we talk about all year long. This is what we believe all the time at Life Changers Church. You know, you can juggle two things at once. You know, you know that, right? You can have faith in God. And faith in his promises and at the same time have wisdom to wash your hands and to keep distance and to be respectful to people and to wear a mask if you're getting too close to people and all. The, and that's going to end. This is coming to an end. It's not going to be it's just not open ended. Don't believe the naysayers that all oh, this is going to take a year or two years or three years. No, it's not. We're getting our hands on it. We're getting our we're laying hands on it. The church is laying hands on it and the government is getting their arms around it. And we're working together, faith and wisdom, faith and wisdom, faith and wisdom, faith and wisdom, kissing each other. Now, for those that are suffering in some way, any sort of pain, the pain of loss, God's going to get it back to you. The pain of sickness or disease. Jesus is our healer. I'm praying for you now, whatever the pain is. Today, I pray that you would be healed. Right now, in the name of Jesus, I speak to every body. I speak to every mind. I speak to the emotions. I speak to the loss, the grief, the suffering, the the sense of loss over money, over inheritance, over jobs, over businesses, over clients, over a family member, over a sickness, a disease. We declare mercy. Father, we come to you, the throne of your grace, and we ask for mercy and we come boldly and we ask for mercy. And I ask for mercy for the man or woman or child watching this right now. Mercy, Jesus, have mercy on them. You've paid for it in your blood and we receive your mercy at the throne of your grace. The mercy that turns into healing, the mercy that turns into deliverance, the mercy that turns into recovery, 
of loss, the mercy that turns into breakthrough in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Well, I hope you're encouraged today. Um, I'll, I'm going to be live tomorrow for a few moments. Those sessions are 5, 10, 15 minutes. Sometimes they go last couple of days have gone a little longer because we've done questions and answers and I'm going to answer some questions tomorrow, hopefully as well. But just know that you're loved. Just know that there's a number on your screen to call for prayer if you need it. And if somebody doesn't answer right away, leave your information. We'll get back to you. Eight, four, seven, six, four, five, ninety one hundred. We're on the job, man. We are on the job as a church. We are on the mission. We're winning souls. I get stories all the time of souls. How many people wrote in? I think just last this past Sunday online, just several people got saved online and content. Many people got saved, but several of them contacted us, asked for this book. If you prayed that prayer, I want to get this book to you. OK, the power of a new life. I'll send it to you free. It's my gift to you. OK, and uh, we love you. We thank God for you. Thanks for tuning in tonight to our Wednesday night Bible study. Good Friday night. Good Friday service, 7 p.m. Don't forget. If you'd like to pick up communion elements, we're going to distribute in a drive through manner, just like a drive through um, pharmacy drive through manner. We're going to with all the CDC regulations, we're going to hand out communion elements that have been untouched, unopened and um, from three to five p.m. at our Hoffman Estates campus on Good Friday and from, I think, 10 a.m. Is it 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. at our downtown campus? And I'll be at our Hoffman campus for much of that time and believing with you and standing with you and, you know, laying hands on your car. If you want me to, I'll touch your car. You know, I'll wipe it off if you want me to. I'll wash it if you need me to. Uh, My God, we just love you and want you connected. And if you if you need that touch, even though we're going to keep our social distance out of honor and out of respect for everybody, uh, we're going to give you a chance to drive through and come up and let's bless you. OK, um, we love you guys. See you tomorrow or see you Friday. Good Friday and Easter Sunday. Bring a friend, invite a friend. Can't wait to see you. Don't have more than 10 people in any gathering at your house unless you have 12 kids. Love you guys. God bless. <laughs>